Hi there and welcome to lecture 2 for Biostats. So today we're t uh, talking about statistical inference which is essentially the process of how we uh, go from a sample which has information uh, that uh, we want on it such as the average uh, age or the proportion of animals diseased to the population which is actually the question that we're interested in, right? The, the um, set of people or the set of animals um, that we're interested in. So how can we go from a subset of that population back to the full population. And so to do that we're going to look at the sampling distribution, okay, which is essentially what happens when we take more than one sample. And essentially when, when we do statistical inference what we think of is when we look at our one sample that we have in front of us we sort of imagine all of the other possible samples that we could have got and that helps us to get an idea of how much uncertainty we should add um, when we make that move back to the population. Okay, and that uncertainty distribution turns out to be a normal distribution, and then there's a, a, a bunch of mathematics that, um, that, that tell us that this is essentially always the case, and we can use knowledge of that one distribution to then uh, tell us lots of things um, about how uh, individual parameters uh, will vary from sample to sample and we'll get into confidence intervals at the end. Now if you haven't uh, yet done the second half of lab 2, the sampling exercise where we looked at the uh, Massey University population and took samples from it and saw how those samples behaved, um, it would be really helpful for you to go through that video now before you go through this one because um, that will give you essentially the understanding um, that we're going to use in today's lecture. Okay, so the process of statistical inference is that um, essentially we always want to know about some population, but uh, in order to find things out about that population we can't measure everything, um, often it's impossible, so instead we take a sample from that population that's hopefully representative, uh, we then find the same things that we're interested in about the population, we find those same equivalents in the sample, and those would be our best guess about uh, what's going on in the population. So for example we might want to estimate a population mean or we might want to show that there's a difference in prevalence of disease between two populations. And essentially we do this by understanding how sample statistics vary from sample to sample. Right? So this is what we did in lab 2. So just a few terms, uh, I've already used most of these. So a sample statistic is a quantity that's um, basically worked out from your sample. and because samples vary, right, so if you take a different sample you're going to get different uh, data points in that sample, different individuals in that sample, and so the summaries of those uh, individuals, your sample statistics, are going to vary from sample to sample. And each sample statistic will correspond to a parameter in the population. Okay, so for example the average age in your sample corresponds to the average age in the population. Your prevalence of disease in your sample corresponds to the prevalence of disease in the population. Okay, and we're going to assume that the population is fixed at least at the time that we took our sample. And so therefore the population parameter, the summary of that population is also fixed. Okay. And in a random sample, the sample statistic tells us something about the corresponding population parameter because a random sample is representative of the population. But of course a random sample will is random, right? So there's the sample to sample variation that we're going to get by taking our sample or taking a different sample we're going to get different summaries so how can we sort of reconcile these to give a single estimate of what the population parameter is. So this is kind of how it works, so we have some population, so this is the, pop the um, distribution of ages of um, students at Massey University, right, and we see that it's skewed to the right, okay, where, where most people were sort of in their early 20s, um, but there are some, um, some people that are significantly older. So perhaps we might want to estimate the average student age, right? So if we collected the entire population, which of course for students at Massey University is relatively easy to do because everyone's got a student ID, you're all on the list. So presumably um, Massey probably knows your date of birth and therefore we could work out your age straightforwardly, okay, and find the average age. That's no problem for this population, but of course in many populations that would not be possible. So suppose we have the average age and we want to estimate this without actually measuring the entire population. So all we want to do is take a sample and then use that to infer what the population mean might be. So we take a sample and our sample, depending on how big it is, um, should look something like the population. So here's one sample here, I think this is of size about 50 odd. Okay, so it's a reasonably large sample. 
and you can see that it looks quite a bit like the population. There's a bit of variation. There's a little bump down here, and the 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 the, the um, bump here is shifted a bit to the right. Um, and we can compute the average age in that sample, and you can see that it actually looks pretty much like the population age. So we got kind of lucky here, and that it looked a bit. It's a little bit different, isn't it? Slightly shifted to the right, but it's about the same. But of course, perhaps we took a different sample. So here's a second sample, and you can see that it differs from the first one. Okay, and because it differs from the first one, the sample mean also differs. So our first sample was a little bit higher than the truth, our second sample is a little bit lower than the truth. And you can imagine as you take more and more samples, of course, you get essentially a distribution of sample means, right? So here all the samples look sort of like the population, you can see there's quite a bit of variation. But there's a lot less variation in the sample mean. Okay, and you can see that all of these samples that I've taken, the sample means are centered around the truth. So while sometimes it's a little bit high, sometimes a little bit low, in the average sample it's actually bang on. Okay, and the amount of variation that we have here really just ends up depending on um, the amount of variation in the population, so what the distribution uh, looks like, and also the sample size. So when we look at the distribution of sample means, we see that it follows this nice uh, sort of bell-shaped curve centered on the population mean, so that drops straight down to there, with some spread. Okay. Notice that we get this nice normal distribution in shape, or bell-shaped curve, even though the population itself was not normal. Okay. So the nice thing about this is that um, we can sort of describe this distribution using a single distribution, a normal distribution, which means that we don't really have to care about the distribution of the population so much. And this applies no matter what the shape is. So here's one that's um, skewed to the right, okay, uh, skewed to the left, sorry, big tail off to the left. And you can see that um, when, we take, when we're looking for the average in the population, we take lots of samples. Those samples vary because the sample size is quite small here, okay. And you can see that the shape that I get is roughly a normal distribution. Obviously it's not it's not ideally normal when it's very small, when the sample size is small, so these are samples of size 10, you can see they vary a great deal, but the shape of the distribution of sample means is actually pretty close to symmetric, it's a little bit skewed to the left here. And that's just a property of how skewed the population is and how small the sample size is. If I crank the sample size up, then I get that nice sort of symmetric shape. Okay, And it doesn't matter what the shape is, so skew to the right, same thing, symmetric, same thing, okay, so you can see that there's two things going on, the shape is always that nice um, normal distribution -y sort of shape, bell shape, um, and you can see that as we sort of quadruple the sample size, so as I go from 10 to 40, it roughly halves the amount of uncertainty, and as I quadruple again, it sort of halves the uncertainty again, okay. So the key things to note are that the samples look like the population but can vary quite a bit, particularly if the sample size is small. But even though the sample itself varies quite a bit, the sample mean doesn't vary as much. So it bounces around the truth. Okay, And the distribution of sample means that you get from repeated sampling is bell-shaped, it's centred on the population mean, and the spread tends to halve as we quadruple our sample size. So it the, the amount of spread depends on the sample size, and if we want to reduce the spread, we need to increase sample size, which kind of makes sense, right? As you increase your sample size, you're covering more of the population, therefore you get a more accurate measure of um, the thing that you're estimating, in this case the, the, the population mean, therefore you've got less uncertainty associated with it, so the sample to sample variation must be less. So we get this bell-shaped distribution, and it turns out we can actually say quite a lot about that distribution. It's a normal distribution, which you've, I'm sure you've probably heard of before, or a Gaussian distribution. And we have um, a bunch of quite rich mathematics that basically tells us that this essentially always happens. So if we have a population with, a, with some mean mu and some standard deviation sigma, then as long as uh, the sample size is large, so n is the sample size is large, then the sample mean, x bar, so that's the mean from the sample, will follow a normal distribution centred on the population mean, with some standard deviation that has to do with the population spread and the sample size. 
in the sample size that's under a square root on the bottom. Okay, so the uncertainty associated with the sample mean is the standard deviation of the sample mean, which is sigma over square root n, so the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So you can see here with the square root of the sample size on the denominator, as I quadruple it, so as I multiply n to and make it 4n, then because the the 4n is under the square root, right? The square root applies to the 4 and the n, so the 4 gets square rooted, and then you end up with 2 on the bottom. Okay? So as you quadruple the sample size, the standard deviation of the sample standard uh, of the uh, sample mean halves. And the neat thing is that this has nothing to do with the distribution of the population. So this always happens. Okay? So essentially it means that we can describe um, uncertainties about any population regardless of the shape of that population using a normal distribution. So we need to know about the normal distribution. Now most of you probably know all this already, um, but essentially the normal distribution describes that nice bell shape. Um, it's uh, described in terms of a mathematical function. Um, and that mathematical function is um, just has two parameters associated with it, which is the measure of center, which is the mean mu. Turns out the mean, the median, and the mode are all at the same location. And it has some measure of spread, so it's the standard deviation in this case. And those parameters completely describe the distribution, right? So once you know the mean and the standard deviation, you know everything you need to know. And um, there's a sort of a rule of thumb which describes how far um, data, data points sampled from this distribution will be from the, from the mean. And essentially, um, it's characterized in terms of the number of standard deviations you are away from the mean. So 68% of the, uh, the data is within one standard deviation. Okay, so that would be the mean minus the standard deviation and a mean plus the standard deviation. That would capture 68% of the data. 95% of the data is within two standard deviations of the mean, which is what I've shown in this figure here. So uh, the gray, uh, the um, area in gray is 95%, and the area in white at each end is 2.5% at each end, 5% left over. And if we go to three standard deviations, plus or minus three standard deviations, then we cover almost all of it, so 99.5%. So it's useful just to note these down and, re and remember them as sort of rules of thumb. This one here is the one that we end up using the most. Okay. And so because of this sort of relationship, we can see that um, the further you are away from the mean, the, the more extreme the observation is, the less likely that observation is to occur. Right? So extreme observations are more than two or three standard deviations away from the mean because typical observations, 95% of them, are within two standard deviations. So anything past that is relatively extreme. And to work out how extreme an observation is, then all we do is work out how far it is from the mean in terms of the number of standard deviations. So for example, if the mean age is 28 um, and the standard deviation is 4, then if you've got an age of 40, that's quite unlikely because 40 is, of course, three standard deviations away from 28. The standard deviation is 4. 3 times 4 is 12. 40 is 12 away from 28. So because that is three standard deviations from the mean, it is quite extreme because less than 0.5% of observations are this extreme because we have our rule of thumb, right? 99.5% are within three standard deviations, so inside three standard deviations. To be three standard deviations or more away from the mean, you've got to be in the tails of the distribution, so that only happens 0.5% of the time. So uh, we have this um, uh, delightful thing called the central limit theorem which is describing that distribution. So that we recall that that's, if the sample size is large, then the sample mean follows a normal distribution with centered on the population mean and with standard deviation, that is the, sta uh, the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. And we can use that in s essentially in two ways. Uh, the first way we can use it is if we know or have a claim about a population mean, then we can compare our sample to that claim or um, known population mean and assess whether it's extreme or not. So essentially we just see you know, how extreme is this relative to what we'd expect given our sample size and the spread in the population. And the other way we can use it is if we don't know the population mean then 
we can just we can uh, take our sample mean and add just enough uncertainty so that we capture the truth most of the time. So this first process is known as hypothesis testing and the second process is known as uh, confidence intervals. So quick example of hypothesis testing. Suppose someone claims that the average age at Massey of Massey students is 30 years old. So to assess whether this might be true or not, we take a sample of size 100, let's assume it's a simple random sample of students at Massey, and we ask them their age. We find that the standard deviation is 9 years and the sample mean is 27 years. So our sample is lower than the claim. Right? But we know of course that our sample doesn't cover the, the entire population, so it could well be 30 and we just happened to get a, a sample that had um, people that were on the younger end of the distribution therefore the average age was a bit younger. Okay, so this is plausible uh, still, but how plausible? Can we, can we sort of figure out how extreme this sample is? Then we know from the um, central limit theorem that the sample mean comes from a normal distribution, it'll be centered on the truth or the claimed truth of 30 um, kilos, 30 years it's supposed to be, and we'll have an, a standard deviation of uh, 9 divided by the square root of the sample size, right? So we've got 9 years as the distribution is the standard deviation of the population divided by the sample size, which is 100. So 9 divided by square root of 100, that's 9 divided by 10 or 0.9 years. Okay, but 27 years, which is the sample mean that we got, is over three standard deviations away from 30 years, right? So the standard deviation of the sample mean we'd expect to be 0.9. 27 is distance 3 away from 30, which is uh, 3 divided by 0.9 standard deviations, which is larger than 3, right? So it's over 3 standard deviations away from 30 years. 3 standard deviations would be 2.7 years, right? So 3 standard deviations away from 30 would be 27.3. But our sample is even more extreme than that. Than that. So it's a quite an extreme sample, so our sample data that we've collected are inconsistent with the actual truth of 30, with the claimed truth of 30 years. So provide some evidence against that claim, right? So our sample is saying actually um, students are, are a bit younger than that on average, um, and our sample data are quite, quite odd if that is, if it is in fact the truth. So it provides some evidence against that claim. We'll get into hypothesis testing in more detail later. So that's the, uh, the first thing we can do is hypothesis testing. The second thing we do is confidence intervals, so we can estimate things. So we know that around 95% of the time the sample mean will be within two standard deviations of the population mean, the rule of thumb, right? 95% of the time if you take a normal distribution the observations are within two standard deviations. Our sample means come from a normal distribution, so 95% of the time the sample means will be within two standard deviations of the population mean. So most of the time, as long as we give uncertainty equal to plus or minus two standard deviations of the sample mean, we should capture the truth. We should capture the population mean. So we're going to use um, the sample mean plus or minus twice the standard deviation of the sample mean, given by that formula there. Okay, then that will work as long as we have a typical sample. And of course we have a typical sample 95% of the time, so this should work 95% of the time. So here's kind of the idea, we have our population, right? And then we take samples from our population and our sample means will sometimes be a bit larger than the population mean, such as these first four samples here, or be a bit lower than the, than the population mean, such as this one. And they'll jump around a bit and sometimes they'll be quite extreme like this black one here. When we add plus or minus twice the standard uh, deviation of the sample mean, which is the red bars on either side here, then you can see that most of the time I cover the truth, the red line, which is the population mean. But some of the time, when my sample is very, quite extreme, I don't. Okay? And we can even know how many times we we're going to be right, we're going to be right 95% of the time because 95% of the samples are going to be within two standard deviations of the, of the population mean and the two standard deviations of the population mean is what we're adding on. Uh, that's essentially our, our, the length of these bars on either side and so we know that we're going to capture the 
the true center 95% of the time. So let's sort of uh, formalize that a little bit. So a 95% confidence interval for the population mean mu is the sample mean plus or minus twice the standard deviation of the sample mean. Now that you remember that the standard deviation of the sample mean is equal to the standard deviation that we get from our sample or population divided by the square root of the sample size. Right, so this quantity here, standard deviation of the sample mean, depends on the sample size. So as we increase the sample size, that standard deviation is going to reduce, right, because the we've got a square root n on the denominator, right, so as n gets bigger, square root n gets bigger, 1 over square root n gets more, right, which makes sense because as we increase our sample size, the uncertainty, which is this, essentially the bit that we're adding or subtracting off the sample mean, um, is going to get smaller. So when we do that, we, we know that 95% of the confidence intervals that we compute are going to capture the population mean which means that 5% of them are not, right? So 5% of our samples will be so extreme that even when we apply plus or minus two standard deviations, we're still not going to get back to the center of that distribution. And of course, for a single sample, we don't know if the confidence interval covers the population mean or not, right? Because we don't know if the one we have is the one of the extreme ones or one of the typical ones. The 95% probability or confidence level apply, applies across many samples, not a single one, right? So it applies in the long run, not for the one we have. For the one we have, we don't know whether we're extreme or typical, but over the long run, 95% of them will be typical and only 5% of them will be extreme. So this really just um, is just critical for how you uh, interpret the confidence interval, right? So the population mean is considered fixed, but each time we take a random sample, we're going to get a different sample, so a different sample mean. So the sample means will be jumping about, therefore the confidence intervals, which are computed based on the sample mean, they're going to be jumping about as well. Right, so the 95% applies only across lots of samples in the long run. But of course in the long run we'll look at many confidence intervals, and if those intervals obey the assumptions that we make, then 95% of them will contain the population parameter. 5% of them won't. So the 95% refers to the algorithm or the process, not a particular interval that you have. Okay, so the key thing really is recognizing that the confidence interval essentially gives you a measure of uncertainty. And as soon as we add uncertainty, then we're admitting that we don't know everything, right? We're giving a range instead of a point. So we're saying actually it could be sort of between here and here. And in fact, because we're only 95% confident, we're even allowing for it to be even more wrong than what we've sort of already allowed for in our in our interval. So really it's a key step in admitting that the data doesn't tell you everything. Okay. Right, so how can we actually do this? So let's have a look at an example. So we've got New Zealand beef and lamb exporting uh, lamb to the UK. And they're interested in the average carcass weight of lamb exported. And so they take a sample of 100 carcasses and weigh them and they find that the mean weight is 18.5 kilos and the standard deviation is 5 kilos. So those are both computed from the sample. So this is just a sample of 100 carcasses. It's not all of them. We want to know something about all of them. So we want to um, essentially take that 18.5 kilos, which would be our best guess at what the average weight of all carcasses would be, and we want to add some uncertainty around that, right? A 95% confidence interval. So you remember what we need to do is uh, we know that the uh, confidence interval is the sample mean plus or minus twice the standard deviation of the sample mean. So we have to work out what the sample mean is, which we already have, 18.5. We also have to work out the standard deviation of the sample mean, uh, which is the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Now the population standard deviation can be estimated by the sample standard deviation, which is 5 kilos. Sample size is 100, so we've got 5 divided by square root of 100, Square root of 100 is 10, so 5 divided by 10.5. Right, so this is essentially the measure of uncertainty that we're going to be using, associating with this, um, this estimate, 18.5. So the confidence interval, 95% confidence interval, is going to be plus or minus twice the standard deviation. The 2 here is coming from that 95% of the time we're within two standard deviations. Rule of thumb, right? So 18.5 plus or minus 2 times 0.5, 2 times 0.5 is 1, 18.5 plus or minus 1, so our interval is 17.5 to 
So we would say that we're 95% confident that um, the average weight of lamb carcasses exported to the UK is somewhere between 17.5 and 19.5 kilos. So we're not saying that it is between that range, we're just saying we're confident that it is and we're giving our level of confidence. Because of course for this particular sample it might be one of those extreme ones where we're further than two standard deviations from the truth, we just don't know. Right, so we're allowing for that by saying actually we're just 95% confident about this. So there's about a 5% chance that we're wrong about this. So how do we do this in our studio? Well, we read in our data. So here's our data, lambs. So it's got a single column weight and 100 different values in it. These are just the first two, of course. Then uh, to, to compute a confidence interval, we use this command here, t.test. Uh, we take the lambs data and we pull out the weight column. Remember, we can do that with the dollar. And we specify our confidence level, 0.95. Now, 0.95 is the default confidence level. So if you don't put anything in there, it will default to that anyway. Okay, And it gives you lots of output down here. Uh, now, the only thing that we'll be using at the moment is, um, let's have a look at this one, so the, our sample estimate. So it tells us what the mean is, 18.5. That's the same as what we got before. Um, and it also gives us the 95% confidence interval, 17.5 to 19.5, exactly the same as what we got by hand. Okay. So, in general, we we won't be computing any of these by hand. You'll just be we'll just be using the computer for it because, of course, the computer's better at um, getting things, getting all the details right. There's quite a few details that don't really matter too much. Okay. So that was a 95% confidence interval. What if we want to be more confident? What if we want to apply a 98% confidence interval? Right. So instead of being just 95% confident, maybe that's not confident enough for us. We want to be 98% confident or maybe 99%. Have a think about what that will mean for the amount of uncertainty, your confidence interval that you're going to add. Is it going to be longer or shorter? If you want to be more confident in your answer, are you going to give a broader range of potential values? or a shorter range of potential values. So I think you want a broader range, right? In order to be more confident, we're just going to be less precise. Then at least we know that we're going to be right, more likely to be right, right? We're giving a, a broader range. And essentially what we have to do, of course, is alter the two that we gave in the formula, right? So our formula for the 95% confidence interval was the sample mean plus or minus twice the standard deviation of the sample mean. And the twice came from that 95% rule, right? In a normal distribution, 95% of the values are between uh, plus or minus two standard deviations. So that's where the two comes from. So if we want to change our level of confidence, we just change the two. So the two is known as the critical value, okay? And essentially what we want to do is we want to find the critical value that associates with the level of confidence that we want. So if we want to be 95% confident, then we know that K is two here, because that captures two standard deviation, plus or minus two standard deviation catches 95%. If uh, we want to be 99.5%, then we know that K is three. If we want to be only 68% confident, we know that K is one. So the computer works out, for a given confidence, it works out what K is for us. So to find uh, a 98% confidence interval, we'd work by hand the same process, right? We'd work out this, the sample mean, the standard deviation of the sample mean in the same way. And then the confidence interval would be 18.5 plus or minus the critical value times the standard deviation of the sample mean, the 0.5. And the k would be something bigger than 2, right? So 2 would correspond to 95% certainty. We want something bigger than 2 because we want to be more certain. So it turns out that k is this number here. Now in practice, of course, we just use the computer uh, to do this. So there it is worked out by hand. And on the computer, we just change the confidence level to 0.98 to be 98% confident, and there's the answer there. Same answer we got before. So what assumptions do we make when we're doing this process? Well, the first thing we're assuming is that the sample mean follows a normal distribution. And this is okay, of course, because the central limit theorem tells us that this is the case, but it has that caveat which is that it says that if n is large enough, but it doesn't really tell you how large n should be. And so 
that's where the shape of the population comes in. If the population is normal, then n can be 1 and it will work. Ideally 2 because you want to measure the standard deviation. Right, so n can be very small. Small samples will work on a normal population. If the population is not normal, but is reasonably symmetric, then a small n will be okay as well. Okay, so essentially it kind of depends on how, how far away from a normal distribution it is, really. If the population is very skewed, then you'll need a larger n. Or, for example, if the population is bimodal or something like that, you'll need a larger n as well. In most cases, the larger n isn't, doesn't actually have to be that large. Okay, so if you um, sort of do a plot of your sample, so do a histogram of your sample, or a density plot of your sample, or a box plot of your sample, just to get a sense as to how symmetric it is, that should give you a, a good idea as to whether you need a really big sample size or a small sample size. Okay, and often the size of your sample doesn't really matter too much as long as it's sort of 50 or 100 or something like that. But there's lots of other assumptions that we make. That's just the mathematical assumption that we make, assuming everything has gone fine in terms of the sampling process. And often, of course, our sampling process is actually the problem. So do we have a simple random sample? Okay, if we don't have a simple random sample, so for example, if we've got um, a sample that's been corrected for demographics or something like that, then our uncertainty from the sample will typically be too small and we'd have to have some correction factor which is sometimes called the design effect which essentially magnifies the size of the uncertainty increases the uncertainty um, is it representative of the population okay a simple random sample should be of course but perhaps the sample we've taken because it's not a simple random sample in some way is not representative are the observations in the sample independent um, often this is not the case because often we take samples um, in a clustered fashion. So for example, if we're trying to estimate the um, proportion of diseased animals within New Zealand, then we're going to go to um, individual farms and sample animals on the farm. And of course each of those animals on a farm are going to be um, similar to each other in some way because they're on the same farm, right? They're not an independent sample of animals in New Zealand. Instead, they're uh, uh, sort of a clustered sample. Right, because they've, all of those animals have been treated in a similar fashion due to management practices, due to environmental effects, um, due to perhaps genetic effects, lots of different things that mean that, the, that each of the animals on a single farm are more similar to each other compared to two animals from two different farms. There's also the potential for whatever we've measured to be, um, to be inaccurate over time. So for example, if you're weighing things over time, then perhaps your scales might drift. Okay, if you're, you're measuring something in a sample, perhaps the equipment that you're using to measure it may drift in some way. Okay, so, um, so that's another thing to, to sort of take into account. So there's lots of things that essentially could go wrong, which essentially usually mean that the uncertainty that you're applying um, from a standard confidence interval calculation is probably a little bit on the small side. compared to what it perhaps should be if you take into account everything. And of course many of these things are very, very hard to take into account. Okay, so it's just something to bear in mind that your confidence intervals are often potentially on the small side just due to the fact that um, the way you're sampled might be incorrect. So if we've got a confidence interval, so we've got a measure of where we think the population mean is, we can use that to assess uh, claims about the population mean. Okay, so if someone claims the population mean is a certain value, okay, maybe they, they claim that the average age at Massey is 30, right? And we compute a confidence interval and from our sample we see that the confidence interval is say 27 to 29. Right, so our sample are, are, are disagreeing with the population claim, right? So the claim was 30, we're saying well with 95% um, confidence it's actually between 27 and 29. And so our, our, our confidence interval, our data are inconsistent with the claim. Right now, we're not we're not going to say that the claim is um, is false, but at least it's providing some evidence against the claim. Now, if the claim had been 28, and we got a confidence interval of 27 to 29, then the 28 would be inside that confidence interval. Then our data is consistent with the claim. Right, we're not saying it's true because we don't know it. We remember we always have to sort of um, accept the fact that we have some uncertainty about it, but nonetheless, at least our data is in the same, giving us the same effect, 
that the claim is, basically. In either case, we're not just going to say our data agrees with that or our data disagrees with that. We're going to give the range, right? We're going to give the confidence interval um, with our conclusion. So it's always important to present the evidence that you have, i.e. write down what the confidence interval is in any conclusion that you make. So let's assess this for the um, for the New Zealand lamb export data. So the UK authority claims the carcass weight at 17.7 kilos. Do you agree? Well, we're 98% confidence that the true carcass weight is between 17.3 and 19.7 kilos. And of course, 17.7 .7 kilos is inside that interval. So 17.7 .7 kilos is consistent with this, this range, so our data is consistent with that claim. Okay, so that could, could be the truth. Uh, what if the claim was the carcass weight is 20.5 kilos? Well, 20.5 kilos is outside that range, isn't it? So our conclusion would be, well, maybe, but our data at least is saying probably not. Okay, and we're reasonably confident about our data, 98% confident, so we're going to give fairly little weight to the claim of 20.5 kilos. So we've got evidence against the claim. Okay, so that's for um, averages, for means. Um, what about proportions? So often we want to, for example, estimate the prevalence or something like that. Well, it turns out that the popular, uh, that proportions are just means anyway. So what you can do is just write a 1 for each unit in the sample that is positive and a 0 otherwise. Then the sample mean of those numbers will be the proportion. So say you had uh, four individuals, uh, three of them are positive and one of them was negative. Then you'd write a 1 for three of them and a 0 for the other. If you take the, the mean of three ones and a 0, right, it would be the total divided by the number that you have. So it would be 3 divided by 4, which is 0.75, that's 3 out of 4, of course, which is the proportion positive. Okay? So the sample mean of those, so the proportion is just the mean. So essentially we can treat proportions in exactly the same way as we do means, so we'd expect the sample proportion to be distributed using a normal distribution, centred on the true population proportion, with some uncertainty associated with it that is um, associated with the standard deviation of the proportion. And it turns out that the standard deviation of proportion is given by a slightly different formula, and it's this one here. Okay, now, uh, as before, none of these uh, formula are, uh, need to be memorised because we will not be using these by hand. We'll be using the computer for all of this work. Nonetheless, we can see that it sort of has that same property where the square root of the sample size is on the denominator. So again, increasing your sample size is going to decrease the standard deviation of the sample proportion and therefore decrease your uncertainty, which makes sense. Bigger sample, less uncertainty. So um, similarly in, uh, in lab two, we saw that um, you know, we had the population proportion, uh, population of um, females and males here. There were more uh, females than males and we saw that when we took repeated samples, they were slightly different to the population but again, we're centered on the truth. So repeated sampling got a normal distribution near shape that was centered on the truth, which is about 52%, and had some spread. And then when we quadrupled the sample size, we saw the same shape, but of course, much smaller uncertainty. So this all makes sense. So we have a confidence level for um, a confidence interval uh, for proportions. So if the sample size is large enough, then the sample proportion will be normally distributed, uh, centred on the population proportion, and with that standard deviation computed by that formula that we saw before. Okay, now this will hold as long as n is big enough, and n being big enough sort of depends both on the so sample size n and also the, the proportion of positives and negatives. So what you actually need is you need np and n1 minus p bigger than 5. Essentially this is controlling the skew, of the, of the distribution of the sample proportion. And these are just the number of positives. So n times p, n is the total number, and p is the proportion of positives. So this is n times p would just be the number of positives. So we need the number of positives, 5, and the number of negatives, 5. Okay, so in a very rare disease, this is quite hard, right? So for example, say you were trying to determine, um, which is um, you know, one of the things they tr they tried to do in the um, when we when we were in lockdown, the first lockdown for COVID, is we wanted to know whether there was 
um, you know, when we'd essentially got down to zero in the community. And of course, if your proportion of positives is essentially expected to be zero, then, um, or something very, very close to zero, you're going to need a massive sample size in order to detect five individuals. Right, so if the actual proportion is something like 0 0.001, then in order to detect five individuals, you need 5,000 in your sample. So of course the actual expected prevalence of COVID was so close to zero that we would have had to essentially sampled everyone in order to rule it out. Okay, so it's um, so in very rare diseases, it's quite hard to get a, a high sample size in order to estimate the proportion. Of course, in very rare diseases, you might not be interested in estimating the proportion all that much anyway, so perhaps it's not too much of a problem. But as long as this holds, as long as you have um, basically five positives and five negatives, at least that, that number anyway, then you can compute a confidence interval for the proportion in the same way that we computed a confidence interval for the sample mean. You just replace the sample mean with the sample proportion and the standard deviation of the sample mean with the standard deviation of the sample proportion. The K here is again the number of standard deviations from a normal distribution for the required confidence level. So if you want 95% confidence, K is going to be equal to 2. All right. So an example, so here's one from um, this paper down the bottom here by Catherine Jenkins. So, we, uh, so Catherine wanted to estimate the prevalence of feline hemoplasma infection in New Zealand cats. And so um, we got uh, a bunch of blood samples that were sent to um, NZVP for routine hemoplasma screening and there was a real-time PCR identified that 62 of the cats out of the 200 were positive for hemoplasma DNA. Right, so our prevalence here is going to be 62 out of 200 or 31 percent and we're asked to find a 90% confidence interval for the prevalence in New Zealand domestic cats. So we want to take that 31% and add some uncertainty. So we're going to do it by hand and then using the computer. So our P, our proportion is 62 out of 200, 0.31. Our N is 200. We can throw it all into the formula and we get a um, standard deviation of the sample proportion of 0 0.033. So our confidence interval is going to be 0.31 plus or minus um, some multiple of 0 0.033. Now we want it to be 90% confident. So we know that um, K here is going to be slightly less than 2 because 2 would be give us 95% confidence. But we don't need 95% confidence in this case. We only want 90%. So K would be a little bit less than 2. It turns out K is about 1.6. Okay, and so we get a an interval of 0.26 to 0.36. So we're 95% confident, no, 90% confident that the prevalence of feline hemoplasma infection in New Zealand domestic cats is somewhere between 26% um, and 36%. Okay. Now, if we wanted to be more confident, so if we wanted to give a more, uh, sorry, to be uh, give a more precise range, so this is quite a big range, 26% to 36%. Say we wanted a, a smaller range, then what would we need to do? Well, there's two things we could do. We could either decrease how confident we want to be, right, which would decrease K and therefore decrease the range, or we could increase our sample size. We could sample more things. If we increase our sample size, then N would get bigger, and because N is on the denominator, this standard deviation of P hat would get smaller, and so this number here would get smaller, and therefore our range would get smaller. Okay, so in order to be more precise, we need to either be less confident or sample more. So in our studio, how do we do the same thing? We use prop.test instead of t.test. So t.test is for means, prop.test is for proportions, and we just give the number of positives and the total number and the confidence level. Again, the stuff at the top here, we'll figure out what all this means later on. Uh, notice our sample mean is 0.31 and our confidence interval is 0.26 to 0.37. Pretty much the same as what we got back here. Not exactly the same because the computer is using a bit of a, bit of a fancier algorithm. Okay, It's got this continuity correction magic added in. But our conclusion would be the same. We're 90% confident that the prevalence of feline hemoplasma infection in New Zealand domestic cats is somewhere between 26% and 37%.
So in general, confidence intervals always take that same form, right? So it takes a estimate from our sample, and it takes the standard deviation of that estimate from our sample, and your critical value k, which just this, uh, deals with how confident you want to be. Okay, so that might be the sample mean, that might be the standard deviation of the sample mean, and k might be 2 for a 95% confidence interval for the population mean. So the only thing that differs between different sort of cases that you deal with is the formula that's used for the standard deviation of the sample mean. Okay, and some of them get quite complicated, so oh, this is one that's not particularly compli complicated. So this is if you've got a difference in a mean between two populations, then um, you use the difference in the sample means as your measure, as your estimate, and then you've got to the uh, standard deviation of this thing turns out to be this here, where N1 and N2 are the sample sizes respectively, and S1 and S2 are the sample standard deviations respectively. Um, there's many other complicated formulas. Again, we're not going to um, remember any of them. Notice that the sample size appears under on the denominator under a square root in exactly the same way, so it has the same sort of properties as all of the other ones, i.e. increasing the sample size will reduce the length of your confidence intervals. Um, but it does so uh, with a square root rule, right? So you've got to essentially quadruple your sample size in order to halve the level of uncertainty that you have. Um, and in R Studio, to do this one, we, we use this uh, configuration here, where t.test is uh, the variable that you're interested in, so that would be the, um, the, the, the thing that you're computing the mean of, and then you've got a grouping variable there for your two groups. Uh, the little tilde there means in terms of, so this would perhaps be the, um, so for example, we could do this on the um, uh, donkey body weights, so we could assess whether the average uh, body weight for males differs from females. Okay, so you would have the body weight as the variable there, and you would have sex as the grouping variable there. Okay, and the data would be our only donkeys data. So what have we covered today? We've covered um, the concept of statistical inference, which is the process of working backwards from a sample to the population. Uh, we've covered how we do that with essentially by knowing something about how sample to sample variation works, so knowing the sampling distribution for means or proportions. We found that that was a normal distribution, and so we've talked a little bit about that. Um, the central limit theorem is essentially the mathematics that underlies the process, and uh, we looked at confidence intervals which takes advantage of that process. So essentially we compute, we know, we understand the amount of uncertainty, the amount of sample to sample variation that we're going to have. We use that as our level of uncertainty and that will capture the truth 95% of the time.